like to welcome you all to uh, ANU. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to have Greg Michener here. Uh, we, we met last, last summer in Rio, a different environment in front of the Botafogo Bay. Uh, and and he's, uh, he's a well-known um, Canadian studying in freedom of information in Latin America. Um, has done a, his, his um, PhD um, um, research on the issue and is preparing a book um, by, that will be published next year by Cambridge University Press. And, and Greg is here in Australia as he goes from many countries to talk about the issue because Latin America has been a case where that freedom of information has spread um, um, uh, into many countries. As far as I uh, have keep the pace with the old work. 13 countries now have 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 freedom of information laws, and and Greg have been, has been living in Brazil and teaching at a very well known um, uh, research institution in Rio de Janeiro, the Fundação Getúlio Vargas, at the at, at the School of Public Policy um, and, and International Relations. And I might add, it's right on the beach. So if you want to study there, it's a great place. <laughs> no, you cannot go to that particular beach, but it, it's a beautiful view. Uh, it's, the, it's the postcard of Rio de Janeiro with the sugar loaf, and, and maybe you can see the Christ. I'm not so sure. But, but we are very pleased to have Greg here, and we'll enjoy your presentation. Thank Thanks. You. I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank uh, Carlos Pio, uh, Muito obrigado. The funny thing is, is that I actually teach mostly in Portuguese, and so getting the chance to speak in English is such a treat. Now to speak in your native language, um, and I'm here for the National Information Law Conference, um, and I'd just like to know first of all, who here is from government? Anyone? Okay, three people. Academia? Anyone? And other people just curious, or is there any particular vocation? No? I'm from El Salvador. From El Salvador, which just passed a law in 2011. Don't know if it's working too well, but anyways, um, we'll I talk about the course in South American history. Okay, all right, great, professor. Okay, so I'm going to uh, to talk about my research, um, and I'm very pleased to be here at the university to to talk to you. I, I extended the hand. I had no idea Carlos Pio was here. If I had known, I probably would not have come here. But, um, <laughs> but I wanted to just talk briefly. You have an access to information law here in, Brazil, in Australia that's been in force since 1982. We have one in Canada that's been in force since 1983. New Zealand has one since 82. So in 1990, there were about 12 countries with freedom of information law. Today there's 94, um, and 35 of those, uh, in two, the year 2000 there was only 35, so it's really exploded exponentially over time. I just want to want to talk, touch very briefly on things you may or may not know. What is freedom of information good for in the first place? Um, when it works, and that is a big question as well, because secrecy is one of the basic political instincts and surrendering it is very difficult for uh, governmental authorities. And so, uh, first of all, uh, friends of mine in the US and Canada, and probably people working government here, know that when they're preparing a document, when they're doing budget work, planning, and so forth, they think not only, um, you know, I have to do a good job because it's my job, but also I have to do a good job because this may find its way into the hands of the media or the public, right? So in the sense of in Latin America, as Carlos knows, Carlos is an expert on uh, productivity. And productivity in the public sector is fairly notorious in Latin America, not necessarily in diplomacia and di diplomats, but definitely in the sense that there's a lot of incompetence, there's a lot of inefficiency, and there's a lot of corruption. Now, traditionally, it's getting better, much better over time. But definitely, freedom of information is a way of giving people that consciousness that yes, this information could fall into the hands of the public at any time. And it makes a big difference in the way that you work. You know? Businesses in Canada and the US account for about half of all freedom of information requests. They want to know about all the regulatory details of every type of government regulation process. 
They want to know why competitor X won the contract and they didn't. They want to know why, how many desks will the province of Ontario buy next year for its school children. They want to know all types of different information. Uh, we should just mention that information asymmetries or information symmetries. In 2002, Joseph Stiglitz and company won a Nobel Prize for information, the work on information asymmetries. Basically, the idea is this, is that perfect information, the more symmetrical the flows of information, the better the flows of information, the better your economy works, the better your government works in general. And so that is, part of this is freedom of information laws. It's part of the, what we call the transparency infrastructure that will provide greater information. Citizens, this is obvious, keeping government accountable, now knowing what's happening, um, not only within the local government, but in national government. And I'll point out an interesting fact here. In Australia and in Canada and in the US, local government tends to be much better at freedom of information. They do better in responding to requests and so forth, because we're closer to them, or they're more accountable. It's the reverse in Latin America still. Perhaps because the laws are young, or perhaps because the bureaucratic, bureaucratic capacity is not there at the local level also. These are, there's definitely, I'm working on another paper that has to do with that, looking into why that might be. There's a reversal between developing countries that do badly at the, federal, at the local level and developed countries that do better at the local level. Um, finally, foreigners and foreign relations uh, if anyone studies international relations here, they know that intentions are a big part of what we look for as diplomats. What, is the, what are the intentions of the other country? Freedom of information laws are used by other countries to actually seek information. And foreigners is interesting, but I have Chilean friends who actually wrote books on the dictatorship in Chile doing freedom of information requests to the U.S to find out declassified documents in the CIA to write about their own country. And so foreigners use the acts of other countries to find out what happened in their own countries or relevance to their own, what uh, companies are doing in their own countries and so forth and so on. So there's a lot of this transnational information flows going on. Okay, so Latin America, as Catalyst said, it's had passed 13 laws since 2002. That's, two, th that's 13 laws and two decrees, presidential edicts, which don't have the full uh, force of the law. And that's the case in Bolivia and Argentina. So in 2002, you had Panama, Mexico and Peru go in 2004, Ecuador and the Dominican Republic, 2006, Honduras, 2007, Nicaragua, and in 2008, three countries, Guatemala, Uruguay and Chile, and then in 2011, finally, Brazil, after much stalling, a very interesting case that we might want to talk about later, um, passed its freedom of information law, as did El Salvador. So I'm going to talk about, in this, uh, I'm going to talk about what factors explain the explosion of these freedom of information laws in Latin America. I'm going to talk about what factors explain the adoption of strong freedom of information laws, because it's one thing to see that an information law is passed, it's another quite to see that, that the law actually works, you know, and that it was passed strong to begin with, because how do you get an effective freedom of information regime? You start with a good law. Without a good law, you're not going to have a good operating regime. Right? Third is how strong laws, which we call de jure strength, right? become operationally robust, you know? and that's the fact of strength. In other words, so the idea here is for those studying in the academic field is that is the is passing a good law, is that enough to make the law work well in the future, or is it actual political conditions, is context king in that sense, you know? exogenous factors. So I was saying that 94 countries now have freedom of information laws, that's 5.5 billion people. Um, and this is a new global paradigm. When we think that the first freedom of information law was passed in 1966, which is the US, uh, this is very recent history. You know? And so these are going to take some time to actually work properly. They're not going to work pro uh, perfectly at the beginning, as, as Australia has found out. And Australia actually had reforms in 2010, which strengthened the law a bit. And there's also a new reconsideration for another set of reforms coming up. 
So how do we explain this explosion of freedom of information laws? I think the easiest explanation is one that you've probably guessed already, and that is the fact that internet and information technology has exploded, which has exploded the amount of information, the excess of the ease of accessing information and so forth. Um, so the advent of the internet really saw the takeoff, or the exponential takeoff in terms of freedom of information laws being passed. With you can send requests in by email, you can receive the information through email, electric archiving made it easier to come across the archives and so forth and so on. Um, the political rationale, and this is not too, com not too complex either, democratization in the 1980s and 1990s, we know that most of Latin America came out of dictatorship, came out of uh, one party, single party rule in the case of Mexico. No. And so one of the tools to deepen democratization was and continues to be freedom of information laws. The question is, is whether, and, and it's a question that we should all ask, is whether basic reforms like electoral reforms and social reforms should be put before more complex instruments like freedom of information laws. Um, democracy promotion comes and falls into the same area as democratization. The transnational trends are really impressive. We've got the OAS, and, and here in Australia, what is the equivalent of the OAS? The OAS is the Organization of American States. So here you've got what? Asian. Asian, right. Now the Organization of American States, because there is a similar language, Spanish, that binds the Organization of American States together, it tends to be very coherent and cohesive in terms of policy. And so they, I remember talking to people from the OAS and they said, what's going on in Brazil? It's like not only the, the Amazon uh, separates us from Brazil, but also the language. We just don't know what's happening in Brazil. And it's funny that when you study institutions at an international level, you find that similarities in institutions like your political system or your constitution have almost everything to do with language. And that's the case with freedom of information laws as well that the freedom of information laws are very similar in Latin America and they're very, sim they're very different for Canada, the US, and, and New Zealand, and Australia, but similar in their own respects because of the English language as well. Um, transnational advocacy also means human rights activists, which is a big part of this question. Freedom of information means freedom to find out the truth about what happened during the dictatorships, you know, the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Especially in the case of Brazil, 1964 to 1985, this was a very big question that, that delayed the law for a long time. There was resistance from foreign affairs, which actually has, let's say, older military elements attached to it, or basically the sort of concerns about what would happen if that information came to light, um, which partially explains why Brazil came to freedom of information so late in the game compared to other countries in Latin America. So we've got institutions like the Carter Center, uh, the Organization of American States, Article 19, UNESCO, all these, all these really supporting freedom of information. Ford Foundation, so there's a real transnational uh, impetus to get these reforms done. Um, and I would say that, you know, these aren't all altruistic motives. I think that the Ford Foundation in the US and the Soros Foundation and so forth, they also want to open up these economies to be able to go in there and actually do business on a level playing field without having the natives favored by their governments in corrupt transactions or rent-seeking transactions. So there is sort of this sort of economic rationale in coming to this. Uh, the crises that came through Latin America in the 1980s and 90s, we're talking about the Mexican debt crisis in 1982, the tequila crisis, 95-96, the Brazilian payao crisis, 98-99, is that right? The, the debt crisis in Argentina, 2001-2002, these crises not only destabilized the whole region, they destabilized international markets, especially because of the connectivity of the international markets due to information technology. And I think that when you see trading being able to happen at a global scale because of the internet and money shifted out of the Mexican economy in one day like that, you need to say, okay, we need transparency in the central bank because the central bank is hiding what, it, what, what the conditions are of the currency. 
and our current account deficits and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what was happening in the 1990s, is you had fiscal and monetary opacity in these countries, which caused a lot of the crises. So freedom of information is definitely tied to that. And the most interesting and most vested uh, stakeholder is probably the World Bank and the IMF. The World Bank and the IMF, the World Bank has more loans outstanding than Latin America than any other part of the world. That means a net amount of money. And think about that, because Latin America only has 650 million people, which is not even half of what China has. Okay? So Latin America's got more loans outstanding than China. Um, and we've got who is supporting the World Bank? Well, in countries like the US and so forth and so on. So these countries are interested in seeing stability. They want the mechanisms to promote that sort of stability. Freedom of information laws, transparency is one, is one way of going about that. The other idea here is responsibility for long, loans gone bad. If you remember in the 1980s and 1970s, even 1990s, the World Bank and the IMF were uh, pilloried for being irresponsible in their loans. They would uh, loan to corrupt uh, Indonesian regimes and, and Brazilian regimes and so forth to build, build dams and then the money would disappear, right? And so a lot of people blame the World Bank and the IMF for this irresponsible game. And these laws give a justification for the banks to say, look, you have the mechanisms to keep your leaders accountable. Don't blame us. Blame your law if it's not working. Blame your authorities. Okay? So it's a displacement mechanism in a sense, no? Okay, so diffusion is one thing. We've got laws, fantastic. We've got 13 laws in Latin America, two executive decrees in 10 years. What does that mean? Are these laws really working, right? So we want to know whether they're windows into government. We can actually see what's going on in government or they're just window dressing here, no? So what are the potential arguments? I mean, what could we say? What would make for strong laws, right? And there's various arguments here. There's competing hypotheses, right? So we've got institutional drivers, like is it really, is it about the democratic transitions? Peru coming out of Fujimori in the 1990, in 1990, had pretty much, sorry, in 2000, because he had a 10-year dictatorship, had almost sort of quasi-transition where the freedom of information law was passed. In Mexico, after 71 years of rule by the PRI, one-party rule, in Mexico you had the freedom of information law passed two years later. So does it have to do with democratic transitions and party alternations, like what happened in Peru and Mexico, right? Does it have to do with divided government or separation of powers? Or is there an explanation? A lot of people in the developed world here, they say you can't really have good freedom of information laws, strong information laws, without good, solid bureaucratic cultures, right? The bureaucracy is the one who's got to provide the information. You're not going to get a good law if you don't have a solid bureaucratic foundation. Then the other ones, ideational drivers, such as scandals. Did scandals cause the, the, the laws to come about? In the case of Chile, there were two very large corruption scandals that led to the erosion of support for the Concertación in, in 2007. And in, coming into 2008 is when the law was passed. And in fact, Bachelet, who was president at that time, I think had been waiting for an opportunity to pass a freedom of information law. The, the question is this, is not whether presidents want or prime ministers want a freedom of information law or a good freedom of information law. Most of them do, because they want to actually manage their government responsibly. They don't want to be known in the future for having corrupt, rent-seeking ministers who made their government into a sham. Okay? The problem is, is that the insiders inside their parties and the ministers who operate the government bureaucracy don't want the laws, and they pressure the leaders not to pass them. Okay? So the leading assumption here in transparency in general, and freedom of information in particular, is that we have an adverse reaction to freedom of information. We don't want it politically. It's not something that presidents want. And so, in the sense of scandals, in Chile we had a large scandal in, in Guatemala, what happened just before they passed the freedom of information law. The president of the National Congress, which is unicameral, he lost $11.5 million because he invested it in some specious uh, stock company. 
And so that, inf that money was gone, and that sort of caused the media to jump on board with the freedom of information, and there we went, right? And so there's these ideational drivers. Then there's leadership. Was it, you know, Presidente Fox of Mexico, was he, you know, was he, his commitment to transparency, was that really the, what drove Mexico? And then the international drivers, like the World Bank, how much are they responsible for strong laws and the IMF and so forth and so on? And so I'm just going to briefly describe my research. When I started to research this topic was in 2003. I was a young student in a master's degree, and I knew about the Mexican law. I thought it was interesting, and my advisor said, go for it. I went down to Mexico, and I researched it, and it turned out to be the most interesting case in Latin America, and really the paradigm, the ideal, typical um, case in Latin America. Argentina in 2000, and I went back to Mexico in 2006 and 2007 to complete research to Argentina in 2005 and 2007 and Uruguay in 2005, and of course living in Brazil since 2008 with my beautiful Brazilian bride. I got plenty of chances to, uh, to pesquisar, to investigate what happened in Brazil. And then interviews in most other countries, and then of course the problem with these laws is that they're very young, right? I mean 10 years is not a long time for any institution to be in force. And so there's not a lot of good data. And that's one big problem that we have in this area. And even in Australia, there's not good data on, on the number of requests, the number that are refused, the number that are partially answered, the number that are fully answered, and so forth and so on. And even those, th that data doesn't give us the full picture of what's happening with these laws either. So I did a lot of content analysis, process tracing, and archival analysis for my research. Now here I wanted to show you this is all the laws in Latin America, and I give you the example of Australia at the beginning. Why I give you Australia is because there's no pointer here. That's okay. The, this is an index, and it's called the Right to Information Index, and you can look it up online. Um, it basically measures the strength of freedom of information laws on a de jure basis, on paper, okay? Which is important. It's not as important as an action, but it's important. There's 63 questions, um, and they are in points for the questions, and these are the results of that index. Now, I chose to, to use this index because it's the only one existing. I actually created an index for my dissertation, which was good, but it was 35 questions. This one's much more comprehensive. And so Australia, you can see, is actually one of the lower scores. This goes from 61, in the case of the Dominican Republic, to 124, in the case of El Salvador which has the fifth best law in the world, although it's not working yet. And we'll talk about that a little later, if you'd like. Um, the case of Dominican Republic is really interesting because a freedom of information law, the assumption, the working assumption, is that you ask for information, and in many countries, you don't even have to identify your real self, okay? I can be Mickey Mouse. I can give you an email at mickeymouse at yahoo.com, and they should be giving me the information there. It doesn't matter what citizen you are, what country, or who you are. You ask for information, it's a public good, it should be given to you. Right? In the case of the Dominican Republic, they passed a law that thumbed the noses at the, any basic standards. They said, why do you want the information? So you have to actually identify why you want the information before they even make a decision to give it to you. So, which is obviously not going to make the law work, and it's not working in fact, but we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. Any questions about this chart here? The commissioner is, is a little technical to get into. It basically said is that a binding commissioner means that they can make decisions about people who are refused information. They can go and appeal to the binding commissioner, and the commissioner can say yes, no, government hand over the information or not. And that's the best, obviously. The courts are the last resort, especially in the case of Latin America. Why? Because they're expensive and they're time consuming. And, you know, money is at a premium. Any questions here? Okay. So, oh, just, whoa. Wait. So the general status of FOIA up here, this is based on content analysis of four years of reports I've looked at and it's basically an approximation of how the law is working. So, as you can see, there's not a lot that are functional. We've got Mexico, we've got Peru, we've got um, Uruguay, 
um, which is surprisingly, because it wasn't a very strong law to begin with, uh, Chile, um, Costa Rica, which doesn't even have a law. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So here is our more graphic illustration. If you, if you take the, the full range, which is 61 right, points to 124 points, and basically your midpoint is in 92 there. And, and, and you can see these, the green, the stronger ones on the right. Now the three groups are interesting. There's, there's, there's three countries that still have resisted law in Latin America. And one is the most interesting, and that's Costa Rica, because Costa Rica is known for its very strong democratic culture and traditions. Um, and it's got an active civil society and a strong independent media, and its government works quite efficiently. Why is Costa Rica not passed a law? Because the activists tell me that they have no interest in a law because they get the information that they want. They ask government for the information, and if the, if the government refuses, they can go to the Supreme Court, which has one part of the Supreme Court is called the Sala Constitucional, and they can get the information within five or six days from the Sala Constitucional. They'll make a decision. So very efficient, very informal, it seems, um, which is terrific. That's the way it should be, without a freedom of information. Venezuela, what's happening here? Well, we all know what's happening. So you've, these two countries, Paraguay and Venezuela, are, are really emblematic of, of two tendencies in Latin America. One is oligarchy, right, which is Paraguay. And that is, you know what happened with uh, President de Lugo, with the parliamentary coup. He was taken out of power forcibly by the assembly, um, by very specious constitutional means. And the other is, so this is a traditional oligarchy, Paraguay, and I dare say that there are other com countries that are in this fold, like Honduras and other countries. Um, and then there's the Venezuela, which is the nationalist authoritarians. And this is uh, Chavez and Correa, and then um, uh, Ortega in Nicaragua, and um, who else? Am I missing someone? I'm missing one other. Ah, Morales in Bolivia. I, thought, I think he's kind of on the softer side of that. And plus, we're very biased by our news media. Um, weaker laws. Argentina only passed a decree, and I'm going to talk about the Argentine situation because I think it is interesting and instructive. Uh, Dominican Republic, I've talked about Ecuador, Honduras, Panama, and Uruguay. Um, Honduras is particularly interesting because of one it basically eliminates one of my rival hypotheses, what makes for strong laws. I know for a fact that the IMF, and in this case the World Bank, were very heavily involved in the passage of laws in the Dominican Republic, Panama, and Honduras. And in the case of Honduras, the, the World Bank foolishly published a paper online that's called Let the Sun Shine In, the Making of the Freedom of Information Law. And it's foolish because if you examine this law, even a person who doesn't know freedom of information laws could see that it's a very bad law, and I'll tell you why. They have an exemption for humanitarian aid. Okay? Honduras received $66 million a year in humanitarian aid, at least last year. That's a lot of humanitarian aid for a country where the per capita GDP is $1,600 a month. right? And so you would think that this should not be exempt from public disclosure. What you do with this money, well, it is. Why? You make the guess. Um, what else? Honduras has an exemption that if the information affects the governance of the country, well then it will not be disclosed. What that means is your best guess. But these type of exemptions will kill a law. So if there are certain, these laws are very fragile, and if you have these sorts of, these points, they will kill the law and they'll be dysfunctional. Um, Uruguay was very surprising because this is a country that has a good tradition of democracy. It's got strong institutions and so forth and it passed a relatively weak law. I think the explanation here um, is that the Frente Amplio, uh, which was a coalition of leftists, came into power after many years of two parties which had relations with the military regime, the Colorados and the Blancos. Uh, they had held power since the re-democratization. And so when the Frente Amplio came into power, they said, okay, we want this law to actually be approved in Congress, and we want to make sure that we step carefully with the state, because the state 
has belonged to these two parties for so long, it's been colonized by them. And if we tell the state that the state has to open itself up right away to everyone, they're going to resist, and this law is not going to work, and we're going to be, we're going to get a bad reputation for, for the law not working. So I don't think it was necessarily that they did not want to pass a good law. I think that they just took it really easy in order to do, make that nice transition over. The stronger laws here, Brazil, Chile, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, Nicaragua, and Peru. Um, the only thing to say here is that Nicaragua's law is not working, and that's, um, that would be in following. El Salvador, it's surprising that it has not been working, but there's been a couple of problems between the president um, and Congress. The Congress is dominated by the party that was in power for how many years? I think it was 24 years before? Basically since the resumption of democracy. Um, and so when this new leftist government came into power, the Congress let them pass a good law, but they just won't let them implement it into power. Um, and so the Congress has not approved a budget for the Freedom of Information Law this year. And since it came into force in 2011, they can't implement the budget without money. They have a commissioner, and the budget has not given the go-ahead, the Congress has not given the go-ahead to release funds. They've also had problems in appointment processes and so forth, but that's, that's, we won't get into that. Um, so what factors explain the variation in the strength of, of Latin America's laws? And we talked about these sort of rival hypotheses all, already, so I'll skip those. I just want to talk to you about the two factors that I found in my research that were really very pivotal. And, and one is the agenda control of presidents. Presidents have enormous powers in Latin America, as you may or may not know, and even prime ministers have enormous powers to some extent, and depending upon the country. They, agenda power basically means what gets on, what goes and gets a vote in Congress. Okay, or in Parliament. The agenda power to set the agenda and actually let something be voted on in, in, in Congress. Um, that, this is a, an important factor and we'll d discuss that with these two countries as examples. The second factor is the activism of the news media. Now, I was told by an Australian today that in the case of Australia, these 2010 reforms, no one wanted to pass them in Parliament. But the, the Australian newspaper came after the senators and said, if you don't pass this, you're never going to hear the end of it. And so apparently the news media has a real vested interest and has, has really put the stick to the government. And this is the case of the U.S. and the case of Canada and the case of Mexico and many other cases. Um, and I'm going to talk about the news media and the importance of, of the news media in the case of Argentina because it's a very interesting case where Argentina, this huge debt crisis, 2001-2002, democracy in peril, stability gone, opacity, corruption, etc. 250 NGOs, and Argentina has a very strong NGO sector. They came after government and they said, we want a freedom of information law, and they actually got President Duvalde, in 2002, to sign a letter saying, yes, I will pass a freedom of information law. So Duvalde, what did he do? Well, he delayed and delayed and delayed, and he used his agenda-setting powers to do that. He didn't even have a majority in Congress, so how did he delay for so long? Well, you can delay in Argentina because there's a procedural rule, and the procedural rule is the following. I'm going to make a motion to have my something voted on, which is a traditional parliamentary procedure. I'm going to make a motion to have the Freedom of Information Law voted on. I get my majority, the motion is passed. The problem is, is in Argentina, you have to schedule it in the next session. You can't vote on the same day. In Brazil, in Mexico, many other countries, you can vote on the same day when you make a motion that's passed. And the law will be passed. Okay? In the case of Argentina, it's scheduled for the next session. What does that mean? That means the president of the Congress, who makes the schedule, can put that thing at the very end of the schedule. And what happens is you've got 200 things to vote on, and they just don't get there. They don't get there, or else everyone gets, the, the people who don't want the law get up and they leave, which means you lack quorum. No. But in Argentina, this happened three times. They actually delayed the law, not passing it, three times by uh, this maneuver. The last time, uh, and the media did not cover this, 
And I thought that this was very bizarre. I mean, I found this out by doing congressional research and going into the, re into the voting you know, role and figuring this out. And it took me forever to figure out because there was no media coverage. I was like, what's going on here? Um, so in the case of Argentina, uh, what was I going to say about the 250 NGOs? Duarte finally passed the law through the lower house. It's got to now pass the upper house, the Senate, right? Who comes to power? President Kirchner, 2003. You know? President Kirchner has a majority in both houses, okay? And guess who's the president of the Senate? Her name is, what's that? His wife. His wife is the president of the Senate. And he instructs his wife, look, kill this law, because this is going to cause trouble for us. And so she does. She proceeds to kill the law that has been half sanctioned. 250 NGOs standing there saying, don't kill it. And what happens? The media was not covering it. So the media was silent on the issue, and they got away with it. And this happened in many other countries where the media was silent, the laws actually turned out quite a bit weaker, I found in my research. Right? So this is the case of Argentina. The case of Mexico is exactly the reverse. So what happens here? Fox comes to power in 2001, and Fox has a promise to pass a freedom of information law. Okay? He is the transparency president. He's going to shine a light on the corruption of the past, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, he gets the power. The problem is, is that Fox doesn't really, he's under a lot of pressure by his ministers not to pass a good freedom of information law. And so he submits a bill that is leaked to the media, which was a piece of crap. The bill was not fit for, to go to parliament at all. And so what happens? Uh, there is suddenly a mobilization among the media. The three largest media players in newspapers, which are Reforma, El Universal, and La Jornada, they get together and they say, we got to stop this. They make a coalition with academics and the three newspapers together and they start publishing like crazy on the subject, forcing the government to act. The government starts acting and they don't really have a choice. You know why? Because President Fox had a minority in Congress. The opposition was in the majority. And suddenly the majority and even the PRI, the old power, was saying, yeah, you know what? We want to keep tabs on this government. We want to open them up to scrutiny. We want to be able to criticize them. So let's pass a freedom of information law. And also, we want to appear in the media because the media really likes this. So let's, let's get in on this. And so that's what they did. They really got in on it. And it passed uh, a very strong law. In fact, this Grupo Oaxaca, which was the group that was composed of academics and the media, got together in Congress, and they were delegated the authority by the opposition to negotiate the final law with the government. And so these activists are sitting in Congress negotiating the law, academics who actually knew something about freedom of information, because guess what? No one on the opposition parties knew anything about freedom of information, which is not uncommon, right? So basically, there's two types of regimes and this is getting a little more political science-y, but that's where I come from. Um, two types of presidencies or two types of regimes that seem to do much better, and this is actually the case wider, not just broadly, and not just in Latin America, but otherwise. First of all, when you've got a president who controls Congress, and he controls the executive, like in Argentina or Honduras, Dominican Republic, guess what? I'm pressured by my ministers not to pass a law, and I have the power not to pass a law because I control Congress. So I'm not going to pass one, or I'm going to pass a weak law. Okay? That's what happens. If the coalition controls the executive, right? So for instance, in Brazil, we've got how many parties in the coalition? 12? Something like that. 12 parties in the Base Alial, which is the coalition that runs government. They run different ministries. So we've got the PMNDB in the Ministry of Mining. We've got the Pente here. These, and what do they do? In Brazil, it was well known <coughs> that they, they would come in and they would do rent seeking. Rent seeking means contracts with private sector that were very strangely done or just stealing in underhanded ways from the ministry. This is very common in coalition government, that they will rent seek. They'll basically take funds, steal from the government. You know? Even in parliamentary systems in Italy and so forth and so on, coalition governments have this reputation. So what does the president want? The president doesn't want a reputation for having had a lousy government. They'll try to marshal a good law through Congress. And so then when they control the legislature, they control Congress, they actually have the power to do that. They can get the law through the Congress without it being killed. Okay? 
Now, when the president does not hold control Congress, as in the case of Guatemala and Mexico, we've already seen that. They, they don't have a choice. The opposition will say, okay, you're going to get a law because we want to monitor you. We want to know what you're doing, and we're going to sock it to you. There we go. No. But when they don't control the executive and they don't control Congress, which means that they have no control over anything, they can't get the law through Congress well because their coalition that is inside the executive stealing money or whatever, they say, no, we don't want a good law, and they will actually weaken it. So in the case of Panama's law, they have one exception which is interesting. They have an exception for all information pertaining to mining and petroleum. <laughs> it's like no information on mining or petroleum can be disclosed to the public. There's all kinds of different ways of, of exceptions. Uh, so questions here, basically the, the little green dots means the ones that are working right now, and the, and the red dots not. No? Questions on this chart here? I'll hurry up, because I know I'm taking some time. What are we at, anyways, in terms of time? Um, 30, 40 minutes. OK, I'll, 10 more minutes here. So one interesting thing that we see is that the stronger laws passed in Latin America, and the ones that are actually doing better now, are the ones that were passed beginning of the president's term. And so the president gets into office, okay, and he's like, uh, can't resist the law or else I want to pass it so that I can make it work, okay? And so we see that most of the strong laws are passed within the first half of the president's term. And in fact, in, in the case of Canada and Australia and so forth, it was very similar what happened. And the weaker laws, a lot of the weaker laws, not this, not too many here, are passed at the end. Why do presidents want a weaker law? They want to get out of power and they don't want people to know what they did in power. So they'll pass it at the last minute, ciao, I'm over here. And then Okay, and that wasn't the end, or was it? A few notable examples. Um, a few things that people should know about freedom of information is that the first international court decision was in Latin America um, affirming the right of freedom of information. And that was this case called Cloud Rays versus Chile, versus the state of the country of Chile. And so what happened here? There was a logging project by Trillium Incorporated. Trillium is an American company. It's coming down to Chile, and it's going into the Condor Valley in Chile to log old growth forest. This is a perfect sort of you know, environmentalist case, right? And so we've got an NGO in Chile which wants to stop this logging, and it wants information on how the Chilean Investment Committee made a decision to accept this contract where they're having this American company come in. They refused to disclose the information on grounds of confidentiality in 1998. This is in 1998. They do all kinds of media tactics. The media does follow it. And guess what? Trillium changes its name three times, the company that was going to do the logging, because they didn't want to be in the media, notorious in the media, and so forth. It goes up. The Supreme Court rejects the petition for information. The cloud raise actually said, I want this information because the American Convention on Human Rights and the United Nations Convention on Human Rights from 1948 both affirmed the right to freedom of information. It wasn't in the law of Chile. It wasn't even in the Constitution. Right? And it finally goes up to the Inter-American Court in the OAS. And in 2005, they accept it. And in 2006, they sentence it. And when they sentenced it, they actually sentenced everyone in Latin America to pass a freedom of information law. And that's why you see from 2006, you see three laws passed in 2008 because everyone said, okay, it's time to go. And Federal Electricity Commission in Mexico. This is an interesting case. This is just one example of a freedom of information request. So this guy wanted to know why Comisión Federal de Electricidad in Mexico was, had this massive contract to take up, it was a private company and they were producing electricity from steam coming into the ground, and they were keeping the profits. Right? And the guy said, hey, steam is a mining resource, and all resources under the ground in Mexico belong to the government, like petroleum, right? And he said, well, then why is this guy profiting from this? And did a Freedom of Information request, and found that $8.9 billion had been stolen from the state. 
uh, 8.9 billion pesos have been stolen from the state, which is almost almost a billion dollars. And so basically, the guy had been operating this electric generator with national property right? and making money uh, for the company themselves. Proyecto Comunidades in Mexico is interesting because prisoners were using the Freedom of Information Law with the help of NGOs in Mexico to find out about what they were accused of and why they were in prison. And guess what? A lot of them went free. Well, more than 32 prisoners went free because they found out that their charges didn't have proper due process or they were trumped up charges that didn't even exist. Okay? Um, Seaper versus Antofagasta. Antofagasta is in the driest desert in the world. It's in the north of Chile, where 50% of Chile's GDP is and the copper mining up there. And what happens? Uh, there's seven companies using water from Antofagasta, and of course water in the driest desert in the world is a precious commodity. And so CPED, which is an investigative uh, journalistic unit in Santiago, wants to know what are the contracts that these private sector companies are getting? Um, and how much water are they taking? What type of water? Is it gray water? Is it fresh water? Etc. Just all the details about the contract. They say, no, this is confidential information. This is a business, you know, Antofagasta is selling this water and the superintendency that regulates the water says, no, we can't provide the information. We're going to protect this company because they have a contract with us and they're just providing water to their clients. No, and this is confidential business information. So they take this to the Freedom of Information binding commissioner called the Consejo de la Transparencia in Mexico, in Chile. The Consejo de la Transparencia is a very powerful uh, information deci decides the appeals. They appeal the case and the information commissioner says, look, says because proper confidenti confidentiality clauses were not made by Antofagasta and because this information is supply and demand anyways, we're going to allow this information to be released. And so they got the information. I don't know exactly what the great repercussion of the information was, but I do think it's a victory nonetheless. Um, now, I'm just going to stop with this strata because this is going on. Because you guys, this is a Brazil, this is an Australian copper outfit, Estrada, um, which is operating in the Andes in Argentina. And what they're after there is copper in the region where there are glaciers and what they call periglacials. And that means basically subterranean glaciers that are not exposed, so you actually can't see them on a map, right? And so the NGOs, they want to avoid any mining, and what are they doing? They're trying to get information on the environmental assessment, environmental impact assessment. Now, environmental impact assessments are one form of transparency that's mandated in 120 countries, right? You have to do an environmental impact assessment, and you must disclose that to the public. And not in the sense that the government, the public has to ask for it, it's got to be actively disclosed on a website. It should be there for the taking. Well, it wasn't there. The government of San Juan, in the province of San Juan in Argentina, didn't post it. And so this NGO went after and said, look, we want the, can you please disclose the EIA to us, the Environmental Impact Assessment? No answer. Can you please disclose it? No answer. So what did this environment, these guys thought, well, what can we do here? We can't, you know, we already petitioned the province, right? Can't go to the federal government because this isn't federal concern. I know, we're going to go to Estrada, and we're going to go to, is that how you pronounce it? Estrada. Well, it is a Swiss company, by the way. It is a Swiss company, but copper, the copper headquarters is here in Australia. I know, I checked that out, actually. I'm putting the blame on you guys for your mining activity. Mm -hmm. um, no, so what happened is they, they decided to go to Australia. And so this NGO says to the Australian government the following. They say, look, we're going to bring you to an, a specific instance in, under the OS, uh, OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, multinational transparency, and we're going to bring you up to court if you don't convince Estrada to release the environmental impact assessment or the government of San Juan. And so the next day, the environmental impact, without any warning, was on the website of the government of San Juan. And so this is transnational freedom of information. They're basically forcing Argentinian government to act by intervening in Australia, which is great. 
Um, and this is happening all over the region now. And so in the case of the Inamari Dam in Peru, which is actually operated by Brazil, Brazil's got 61 dams planned by 2019. 61 to be built, okay? There's six in the Peruvian Amazon being built right now. 80% of the electricity is going to Brazil. They're gonna be operated by Brazil, right? And built by Brazilian companies as well, which is all the Brege and all the big ones. Um, and so they wanted to know about the environmental impact assessment in the case of the Enum and Bali, because you've got to do these, right? And of course, the problem here is a problem that you have in Australia as well, which is confidential information. This is a private company in Brazil that is building the dam, a consortium, right? And of course, they've totally distanced themselves from government to be private, so that they're not available for the request process, for freedom of information requests. And so that's essentially what happened is it was a battle to get the environmental impact assessment. And finally, the Peruvian Supreme Court decided that the environmental impact assessment had to be disclosed based on the freedom of information law and also based on the Constitution's necessity for environmental protections and so forth. So at least the courts are coming up with good decisions in the sense that the courts are acting appropriately and the freedom of information is working to some extent. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention, my very long-winded presentation. Huh? Okay. Here's the final one. We poked holes in the black box, right? No, I think you're right. In fact, in Bolivia, we just had a similar situation with a highway being built with, by Brazilians, and the Bolivian peasants revolted, and it was abandoned eventually. But uh, I think a lot of the countries are a little frightened by the Brazilian thirst for hydro energy and development throughout the region. You know? um, they have a national security clause in every country, and there are a standard, and I can refer you to websites and so forth. There are a standard set of exemptions that are modern exemptions. I've read the exemptions in Australia, and they're not modern. Um, they're not. Uh, and here you can have indigenous band councils are exempted. There's all kinds of different exemptions here that are very strange. In, in, in Latin America in general, most of the laws are really very high standard. They're better laws because uh, with over time, the normative aspect of laws improves and the legal standards improve, right? And so a law made in 1982, like Australia's, is just not going to be as good. It's like having a Corvette, uh, a Chevrolet from 1982 versus a Chevrolet today. I mean, the efficiency and power transfer and so forth is much better today. And so um, the exemptions are standard, typically. You've got legal process, you know, you've got national security, you've got international relations, um, and so forth. The one interesting aspect of freedom of information exemptions here is that we have a public, you know what a public interest override is? Basically, it's a balancing test. It means that if the information is deemed more of value to the public than it is, than the exemption, right, than the exemption merits, then you give it to the public, right? You disclose. So the, the one public interest test that quite a few laws in Latin America have is this. You cannot exempt information that is relevant to the abuse of human rights fundamental rights. And that's a very powerful public interest test because that means that any information having to do with what you might call a human right, which is a very wide uh, environmental right, social rights, what is a human right? I mean, there's, there's many different definitions, right? Can be public over public interest override. So you can take that to court and really get the information released on those grounds. And that's what's happening actually. Um, and so the exemptions are very strict and there's no funny business. There's standard exemptions all over the world, um, and mostly the ones that I've, that I've talked about. You know. The national defense is a typical one, mm -hmm. and not the budget of national defense, only defense operations and so forth. You know. And in fact, you talk about national defense, it's interesting because in Latin America, with the military histories, most of these countries, like in the case of Peru, Peru has a good law, but what happened? They had a minority in Congress, president was weak. They actually savaged the national security um, exemptions, made them very wide, and then the, the law was challenged on constitutionality and thrown out by the Supreme Court. They had to remake the law again. Because the national security in Peru, you know, 85,000 people were killed during the Shining Path. I mean, there's, there's that sort of thing. And so, 
Ecuador, Peru, uh, Guatemala especially had a very strong uh, movement to weaken the law on the basis of national security grounds. It was actually amply defended. And the great thing is, is that they specified exactly what information about national security must be disclosed. And so there's, there's, there was a lot of attention paid to these laws by a lot of people from all over the world. Um, a real transnational effort. No? Questions. Sure. Uh, one having to do with the with the relationship between activists and the World Bank. Mm -hmm. Has 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 the, the 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 role that the bank has played has in some way softened out its image in in the region, or especially among human rights activists or uh, NGOs of, of different uh, involvements in, in terms of the issues. And I think it is. I think it is softening. I think it's getting better. What the World Bank is doing is this. The World Bank is instead of going in like it did in Honduras and telling governments, you know, you got to pass a law and then watching them pass a bad law, um, they're getting the government of Mexico, they're funding the government of Mexico's E5, it's Instituto Federal de Acceso a la Información Pública, to go in there, the Freedom of Information Institute, to go into Guatemala and to give assistance to Guatemala to pass a good law. And that's exactly what happened. So they're using what we call transgovernmental relations to actually improve the laws in other countries. And I think that the World Bank has been pretty smart. They've gotten a lot smarter. The IMF is very quiet, and I really don't see a lot about them. Um, but it's, it's notable that the, where the World Bank had the most effect, like in Dominican Republic, Panama, and Honduras, there's actually no known, very known advocates. Like, when I read the reports, five years of reports, they don't have any section from those countries because there's no NGOs that actually know about the law. Um, and so it seems that they're trying to fill the gap you now, and they come in. And what's also notable about Honduras is that Honduras actually, the media was against the law. And in the case of Argentina, the media was against it as well, and I'll explain why briefly. Clarín, which is the biggest Argentine newspaper, owns 33% of the newspaper market in Argentina. Okay? That's the most market share of any newspaper in the Americas. Okay? Folha de Sao Paulo owns 14% of the market share of Brazil. Okay? So Clarín has enormous power. The saying goes politically that if you're one week on the front page of Clarín, you're going to get out of power as a president. One week of bad coverage on the front cover of Clarín, that you're going to be out of power. That's the saying that I was told by a senator in Argentina. But basically, Clarín said to me when I went in and talked to the managers there, they said, look, to tell you the truth, freedom of information is really not in our, our interest, okay? and not in the interest of journalists. I said, why? He said, well, look, these journalists have cult cultivated exclusive sources over many years. Why do they want to democratize information? Okay? We, we have the power to get information. We're the biggest, and, and we have the most weight in, our, in Argentina. And we can, we can go to a minister and get information from them if we want, okay? We don't need to, a law to do this, and we certainly don't want to let competitors into the industry. And I thought that this was a very terrible <laughs> attitude because the public interest is out of the question here. I mean, media should be serving the public interest to a certain extent, we, should, we think. But in that case, it was clearly not, not in there. And in the case of Honduras and even Paraguay, where the, the, the media was against the laws, they thought that they would make the, the government would actually turn the law into what's called a Le Mordaza, which is a gag law. And so they start out with the freedom of information law, and by the time it gets out of Congress, it's a law to restrict media freedom. And that actually happened almost in Uruguay. And it's happened, you know, it happened in Paraguay as well. It happened in Zimbabwe. They passed the Freedom of Information Law that actually gagged the media. And so I think there's a fright that anything having to do with information, we don't want. We want as much freedom as possible because if you're going to regulate information, you're going to regulate the media, and we don't want that. And that's the logic there. There's a lot more interesting stuff to be said about the media because the relationship there is, is pretty fascinating. To be honest, I, I don't think that, um, to be honest, first of all, to answer your question, the Inter-American Court is a pretty, I mean, it's a, it has been powerful because it's got a couple really interesting precedents here. And this precedent, just to let you guys know about it, um, I'm not a professor on this, but 
I'll tell you basically what I know about it, is that there were human rights uh, violations committed during the dictatorship of Brazil. People were disappeared um, in this region, Brazil, and the relatives of these people wanted information on what happened to their relatives. And so uh, the court ruled effectively that keeping information from these people was a form of torture, and that was an abuse against human rights, and basically mandated that Brazil pass a Freedom of Information, take the steps necessary to disclose and pass a Freedom of Information law and so forth, which is pretty much what they did in the case of Chile. And I don't know about any time frame they established for Chile, and to be honest, I've not read one anywhere, so I don't think one exists, because I've done my research on this. And I don't know about Brazil, and I don't think it was pivotal for Brazil either. And I don't think it was pivotal for Chile. I think Chile had been delaying it for so long. Chile is the case of the biggest resistance in Latin America. It's the hardest fought case. Because from 1998, the government actually passed what's called the Ley de Providad in 1999 which established a disclosure mechanism, but it wasn't a freedom of information law, and it was very discretionary. And so they tried to appease the advocates by passing one law. And then in 2005, they passed a constitutional reform that provided that all executive branch administrative had to uh, disclose information, but it was also very without regulation. And so they, they tried to appease, they tried to appease, and they knew they had to pass a law. And when these two scandals happened in the fall of 2006, and Bachelet was, was eager to get this done anyways, she said, yes, we're passing a freedom of information law. And despite her ministers who might have been saying, no, don't pass it, we don't want transparency, the cards were stacked against them because the media was on board, the scandals started to destroy the party, Concertacion, that eventually lost the election, one of the reasons was because of the two scandals that happened. And so I don't think that the inter-American court decisions were that as important as people say they were. And advocates especially will say, well, this is so important, blah, blah, blah. I think it was in the cards, it was coming anyways. Chile is an advanced country. It has aspirations to be in the OECD and so forth and so on. It, it, is, in the it is now, but at the time, right? And so I don't think it was, it was trying to drag its feet. I think it was, it was moving towards it. It just needed that trigger, which was the scandals. I think the scandals were more pivotal than the actual Maybe decision. Maybe in the case of Brazil, I don't think Well, I think that Juma uh, created the conditions. I'll tell you what's interesting is that Lula is a politician, okay? And Juma is a technocrat, right? She's a technocrat. Juma wants to control both Congress and the executive, okay? Lula didn't care if he controlled the executive, he wanted to control Congress, okay? So he wanted to appease Congress, and he did not want to offend anyone, okay? And especially the military and Itamarachi. And he, when he entered it, the first law that came in, when the initial bill came into Congress in Brazil, it was a very weak law. It was much weaker than the one that was passed. And so what happened? In 2009, Lula introduced the law, it goes into Congress because of pressure from the UNESCO and other people, and he promised in 2006 that he would, in his election campaign, that he would introduce a law and so forth. And then he didn't want anything to do with it. He, he, he left it for Juma. He was like, ciao, I'm out of here. No. Juma, when she got into power, she created the conditions to justify the passage of a strong freedom of information law. How did she do that? This is very interesting. How many ministers were dismissed on corruption allegations in the first year? Seven. I think it was six or seven. Six or seven. In her first year, okay, one year, six ministers were out on corruption. What happened the next year? None. And there hasn't been any since, okay? No ministers have been dismissed. In that first year, which was the most pivotal year for the Freedom of Information Law, she made the conditions not only to pass a Freedom of Information Law, by making this basically, our government is corrupt, we need you know, transparency, blah, blah, blah. She also joined the Open Government Partnership, which locked her into the commitment. She, she was the leader of the Open Government Partnership, which is an international initiative to support openness in government, transparency, open data, blah, blah, blah. She locked herself into that commitment, which meant that she had to pass a Freedom of Information Law. She also promised a truth commission, which she eventually moved forward with, and she opened an open data portal, 
in her first year. So she was like, let's go. She created the conditions and she wanted transparency because she wanted to monitor her executive. She wants people to monitor her. her. I think the, the will was there. She's a technocrat. She wants to control our government. She wants to make it hers. She doesn't want it to be Lula's, no? Um, and so she's forging her own identity in a sense. No? So that, that's my take on it. You guys might think differently. No? Any other questions? So why do I invite you all to um, share more of Greg's knowledge about, about this issue yeah, during refreshments? So I, I also invite we all to, uh, to join me to uh, uh, thank Greg for coming here and, and sharing this knowledge in a very, very nice way, very good presentation.